more time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand praise in here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody take, take a few moments to tell God thank you. Come on, somebody take a few moments to tell God thank you. Hallelujah. We thank and praise God just for being here. We give God praise and we give God glory just for being in the land of the living, let alone being in the house of the Lord one more time. We honor God for this day and for this time. Uh, at this time, we're going to go ahead and get started in our service. We're going to go to God in prayer. Is that all right? All right. Amen. We're going to go to God in prayer. Is that all right? All right? Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you and we praise you today, God. We thank you, we praise you just for another day that you've allowed us to see. God, we thank you just for our life, our health, our strength. We thank you just for your grace and your mercy. We thank you just for being an awesome God to us. We thank you for your patience, God. We thank you for being long-suffering. We thank you just for being an awesome God. God, we pray that you continue to have your way in our lives, oh God. We pray even now that you have your way in this service. God, word our mouths. God, give us understanding. God, open up our ears to hear what you are saying to the church. God, we thank you just for this opportunity, God, to study your word, to hear your word, to most importantly apply your word to our life. God, we thank you when we pray. We lift up the sick and the shut-in everywhere, God. We lift up the homeless, the widows, God. We lift up everyone that is hurting in a season like this, God. We pray that you put forth a special hedge of protection around them, God. We pray that you send forth comfort to broken hearts, God. We pray that you lift up bowed down heads, God. Encourage broken hearts today, God. In the name of Jesus, you know exactly what we all stand in need for. And we pray that you be a need meter on today. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We thank and praise God once again just for being here. Uh, and we've got quite a bit to go over on tonight. So I want to go ahead and get right into it. Let's start actually just with, uh, we're starting with our part two of our series, which will more than likely complete this series uh, talking about the church. Somebody shout the church. the church. Amen. We're talking about the church. And just to recap, so on last week, we talked about the church and really the purpose of of the church. We talked about the purpose of the church. We talked about how the definition of just, just Webster or Google will tell you that church is a building uh, that's used by a Christian or for Christian public worship. But we took it a little bit step uh, a little step further than that. We found out that the church is not just necessarily a building only, but it is a people. It is a group of people that have a mind and a heart to live for God that have been saved and sanctified and filled with this Holy Ghost. We are the church as well. We talked about not only that, we talked about what the scripture that we went over on last week for principle that it tells us that we should be doing within the church. And how many know we don't just come to do and we don't just come to say that we came to church, but we want to be effective in what God called for us to do in the church. We talked about teaching biblical doctrine, making sure that everything that you teach is based on scripture. We talked about uh, the church being a place of fellowship for believers. We talked about it being a place where you can observe the Lord's Supper, and then we talked about it being a place of prayer, not only just praying, but teaching prayer, modeling prayer, what prayer really is. We talked about how uh, in this unity or in this fellowship of believers, we should be able to instruct one another. We talked about how we should be kind and compassionate to one another. We talked about how we should encourage one another, love one another. But tonight we're going to part two. Yes, we got the basics of what should be done in the church just from a standard position. But tonight we want to talk about, again, the church, but gifts and members. Gifts and members. Members. So I want you to turn with me uh, because Paul has a lot to say about this in the 12th chapter of First Corinthians. So we're going to read, uh, we're going to go through this whole chapter on tonight if time permits. Uh, it is again First Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and we'll break this up into parts, but that's going to be the chapter in its entirety. So again, uh, when we ask the question, what is the purpose 
of church? What is the purpose of church? Paul uh, gave us an excellent illustration to the believers here in this 12th chapter. And as he's writing to the Corinthian church, understand that the Corinthian church are a group of newer believers. They were not like many of you and I. Uh, we have grown up in church, many of us. We, mom and daddy took us, grandparents took us. We know church protocol. We know what we should look for. We know how to look for it. We can raise up our hand. We, we've been taught and have some experience in these things. But understand the concept here, as Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, they're a new planet church. They're a church that is just learning what it means to serve their Messiah, Jesus. So he tells us, or he tells them in this chapter, he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away into these dumb idols, even as you were laid. So Paul is talking to the Corinthian church now. He, he, he's sharing wisdom, sharing understanding. Why is he doing this first? He says, I don't want you to be ignorant. And I know many times when you hear the word ignorant, many of us, we get offended, but what ignorance means or ignorance is just a lacking of knowledge. It is a lacking of information. It's a lack of awareness about a particular thing. I'm sure many of us can attest that I'm ignorant in some things. I, there's some things I just don't know. There's some things that I am not aware of. So Paul is not insulting them. He says, my, my concern for you is that you do not be ignorant by any means necessary, especially when it comes to spiritual gifts. And then he tells them, he says, I know that you were Gentiles carried away. Goes back to that historical, historical portion. They were not a people that grew up and knew who Jesus was. They were not a people that studied the word of God. They were not these types of people. He says, I understand your past. Let me make sure I break this thing down to you. And there are just some things that we do not know, but he shows this important topic that I don't want you to be ignorant. And I want you to just stop right here because Paul in his writing, in his letters, there was only three times where he told someone in his letters not to be ignorant. Three times where he told them, listen, you're not going to know everything, but in these specific specific titles or topics, I do not, I cannot have you being ignorant. I want you to write this down. Romans 11 and 25, it tells, he tells them, he says, do not be ignorant of God's plan for Israel. Romans 11 and 25, don't be ignorant of God's plan for Israel. Number two, he said in 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, what we just read, don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts. Don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts. That's 1 Corinthians 12 and 1, which we just read. And then thirdly and lastly, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 13, he says, don't be ignorant about the second coming of Jesus and the eternal state. Don't be ignorant about God's plan for Israel. Don't be ignorant of spiritual gifts, and don't be ignorant about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And sadly, his reminder to these churches and to these people, this is where many of us are lacking and where, we're, where our ignorance is. Because we have heard something or saw something and we associated it with what we thought it really was. But he breaks it down here. So we're reading. The Bible says, he says, even as you were led, wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God call it Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. He says anybody that has the Spirit of God would not call Jesus a curse, will not speak words against Jesus. And then secondly, any man that says that Jesus is the Lord can only do so by the Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to at least understand now, now what he's saying. In this context, we do not believe that this is... Uh, just meaning as simple as mouthing the words. How many of us have mouthed some words before? We said some words. I did not know the full context or the meaning of what we were saying. I, I don't know about you, but as I was a child, older people would tell me, say this to that person. Say that didn't really know the weight of the words that we were saying. So he is not saying that no one cannot say that Jesus is Lord. But what he's saying is that there is uh, that no one can say this with truth and sincerity. 
with truth and sincerity unless they do so in the Spirit of God. And then it says, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities, diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And that's where we want to start with our gifts on tonight. He says there are all kinds of different gifts. We all have different talents, uh, uh, natural talents. Many of, some of us can sing, some of us can play instruments, some of us uh, have uh, uh, sports, uh, sports uh, opportunities or uh, able to play sports. Uh, so he says there are different diversities of gifts. There's different gifts, but I want you to understand that it is the same spirit that gives the gift. We get to the fifth verse, he says, and there are differences of administration. So in other words, he says there are different administrations, which means there is different ministries, right? There's different administrations, but the same Lord. There's a difference in operations. There's, they do different jobs, but it's the same spirit. It's the same God, which work it in all, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all, I want you to understand that in every, even in our natural soul lives, right? Even in our natural soul lives, we've got different job titles, right? You go to an office specifically, you've got some assistants, you've got some managers, you've got some uh, uh, clerks, you've got some receptionists. We've got all these types of offices, but they're still working under the same job. They're still working for the same business. They're still working for the same owner of the business, and that's how it must be. First, you've got to understand this when it comes to the church. We've got to understand that's when you can push aside pride. That's when you can push aside your own desires and your wills to be great and your name to be great when you understand that it's, the st it's still the same spirit of God that gives all of these different things. So he says, I, I, I want you to pay attention to this. He says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is to given to every man to profit with all. In other words, the manifestation, the, uh, all that really is, is a bigger word for a display. So the display of the Spirit, to, for you to be able to see the Spirit in action, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all, which means it's for common good. It's not for us to elevate ourselves. Have you ever met someone with a with a, a, a gift of a spirit or a gift of the spirit, and they would constantly point at themselves instead of pointing to the God that gave them? Have you ever seen a prophet or uh, an apostle, someone that talked and brought their name greatness and lifted up their name, but they would not point that back to God, the giver of the gift. So we, he, he begins to explain to them now, it, it's it, God gives it to every man for a purpose. There's a purpose. When we work on our job, we're working for a purpose. We When they set those goals and those parameters of what you got to meet, it's for a purpose. It's for productivity. It's, it's for the business to grow and sustain itself. It's the same way when it is with the church. When God gives us a gift, when God allows us to have something that's extraordinary, that we know that we did not obtain ourselves by any goodness of ourselves, We've got to understand that it's for a greater purpose, and that purpose is to build the kingdom of God. So he goes on. He says, for to one is given by the spirit the word of wisdom, another the word of knowledge, and by the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another the gift of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And I want to break these things down. These are the gifts of the spirit. The Bible talks about other gifts uh, when you get to, I believe, Ephesians when Paul is writing. But in this scripture, we talk about, he, he talks about the gifts of the spirit. And what did he list? He said there is a gift called the word of, uh, word of wisdom. There's a gift called the word of knowledge, there's a gift of faith, there's a gift of healing, there's a gift of working of miracles, 
There's a gift of prophecy. There's a gift of discerning of spirits. There's a gift of diverse kinds of tongues, different kind of tongues. And then there's a gift of interpretation tongues. And I don't want to be vague on tonight. Let's go a little bit deeper into what these things really mean because many of us, we've got our own interpretation. So I, 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 I found this, uh, this bit of a list here uh, what we want to go through and see what these things really do mean. So when it talks about the word of wisdom, the meaning of that gift is the content of God's word. Have you ever seen someone that when they hear the scripture or they read the scripture, they just got wisdom. It seems like they, they can just tell you what the scripture means off the top of their head. They don't have to go and spend hours of study. They don't have that. That's a form of the word of wisdom, being able to flow and speak in the wisdom of God. But what that means is it's the content of God's word. That's a gift that God allows us to have if we have the spirit of God. That's the word, the gift of wisdom. Then it talks about the gift, the word of knowledge. So the word of wisdom is the content of God's word, explaining and understanding the, God's word. The word of knowledge, however, is God's will made known. The word of knowledge. And many times people mistaken this with prophecy. So the word of knowledge is if, I'll give you an example, if God gives me revelation to what is going on in your life, that would be a form of a word of knowledge. It's God's will made known to someone that does not know. Whether that is in an interpretation of a dream, whether that knowledge is given in a dream, whether it's given in a vision, whether it is spoken to them directly, that is the gift of the word of knowledge. God's will made known. And I'm going to slow down for those that are watching as well. Uh, so we've got the word of wisdom, which is content, content of God's word. We've got the word of knowledge, God's will made known. And then he talks about a gift called uh, the gift of faith, the gift of faith. And we know faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What he's talking about is a greater level of the gift, uh, a greater level of what we know is just normal faith. So what faith is, it's, uh, it is belief and trust, but it's belief and trust enabling to godliness. It's a different level of faith. I, I, I believe that gift is similar to what Abraham had, where it really wasn't no doubt, much doubt of what God can do, but it is a gift that God can give us when it comes to the spirit of God. So he says the gift of word, uh, the gift of wisdom, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, the gift of faith, and then we get up to the gift of healing. And many of us, we, we, we have seen or experienced or know this but the gift of healing, the meaning of that gift is that gift allows curing beyond human ability. You know, there it's one thing for you to take an Advil and, and, and pain relieves. But there is another when the spirit of God comes in and takes pain away. That That's above human ability. That's above what I can take over the counter. That's above what the doctor can do. That's the gift of healing. These things God says that we can have as people of God, as people that have his spirit, that's another gift. Then he says the gift, not only receiving the gift of healing, but now he says the gift of, uh, the gift of working of miracles, effecting of miracles, working of miracles. So this is also a gift that he said that comes with the spirit of God. And what is the affecting or the gift of miracles is doing supernatural acts. It's acting and going through uh, the acts of miracles, something that we cannot, again, that we cannot do by ourselves. It is the spirit of God that gives us a, an opportunity to receive the gift of Miracles, being able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, being able to speak unto the mountain and tell the mountain to be removed. These are the gift of working miracles. Two fish, five loaves of bread, bless them. And they, these are things that we cannot do by ourselves. God says this is a gift. The word says this is the gift of the spirit. 
And then we get to prophecy, and this is one that many of us are well known of, at least the title, because we know one or two prophets that uh, uh, that we have seen or watched on TV or have saw in some type uh, of fashion. But what prophecy is, is not just foretelling the future, but it's even teaching the word of God. So the, the gift of prophecy shows itself in teaching and foretelling. That's when you would see, especially in the olden times, when you talk about prophets, when, when you talk about uh, Elijah, when you talk about Isaiah, when you talk about Jeremiah, when you talk about these prophets, these were not just people that would come and tell you what's going to happen in the future. Yes, they would. That was a portion of it. But they were ones that would teach, give instruction all a part of being a prophet. God says prophecy is a gift of the spirit. Yeah. And then we get to the discerning of spirits, the discerning of spirits. He says that's a gift of the spirit to be able to discern, which is really just testing true or false spirits, testing true or false speech, being able to see beyond what the natural eyes can see being able to understand above what our own comprehension can understand, that's being able to discern spirits, discern, discerning of spirits, testing true and false speech to where you are not deceived, to where you will not be able to allow others to be deceived with this gift. And understand, I want you to see the concept of all of these gifts. This is not just for you to use by yourself. This is not just for you to use only on your own self. But all of these gifts, he says, I'm going to give you a gift, but I want you to use it in the kingdom. I want you to use it to be able to build the kingdom. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the church. All of these gifts are not just to be held and set down on, but they're to be used for the furthering of the kingdom. We're almost done with this list. So now we've got, so far, we've got the word of wisdom. We've got the word of knowledge. we got the gift of faith. We've got the gift of healing. We've got working of miracles. We've got prophecy. We've got discerning of spirits. And then we get to different kinds of tongues. The gift of speaking in different tongues. Now, all that means is a different language. And listen, we can have an, a whole different Bible study on the different outlooks of what people believe that this uh, scripture means or the other scriptures where it talks about tongues. We know, at least in Acts, the second chapter, when the Holy Spirit was first uh, and dwelling on the inside of men, that they cloven tongues were appeared above them, and they spake in other tongues. And these were not just gibberish tongues; these were tongues that other people understood. It got to the place or the point where, when they came out of the upper room, the people said, "How are you talking in my language? That's my language. I hear." All, and all these people were from all kind of different places, and they said, "I hear this word in." This, I hear this word in my own language. How are y'all speaking? Got to the point where they said, you are drunk with a new wine. Yeah. Because they were speaking in different kinds of languages, different kinds of tongues. And, we, and there's even other scriptures that tell us there's another form of tongues that is unknown, that cannot be interpreted, but we can get to that another night. On, but he says, this is a gift. Speaking in diverse kind, different kinds of tongues. And then lastly, I don't want you to be foolish. I don't want you to be ignorant. Not only am I going to give you tongue, but I'm going to give you a gift to interpret the tongues. I want you to be able to interpret the language. I've seen some people or experienced, at least heard some stories of people that have gone to other countries and just begin to speak in tongues and it was the origin's tongue of that other country for they were able to declare the word of God and have never took Rosetta Stone, have never ever took any type of classes on knowing the language, but it was the spirit of God. It was a gift. And I know that we are so formatted to know or, or to think, at least in our own lives, when you give me a gift, I'm going to use it how I want to. But there is a difference when we're talking about a gift from the Spirit. You give me a gift on my birthday, I, I, you can't tell me what to do with it. But there's a difference when we're talking about the Spirit of God, because the Spirit of God, it gives us gifts, but it tells us exactly that we must use it to build the kingdom of God. It's not to be set on. Yeah. So the scripture continues. 
It tells us, and I want you to see the consistency as it goes down through the list. It told us line after line. It told us uh, one, the working of miracles, the, the prophets the, uh, uh, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. And it said to another different kinds of tongues and the interpretation of the tongues. But in that 11th verse, it says, but all these work at that one and the self-same spirit. All of these different gifts. But he says it all comes from one spirit. One spirit. And somebody may say, listen, that, that must mean I can have it all. All I got to do is ask for all of them and he'll give me just what I want. Keep reading. The Bible says, dividing to every man severally as, not as the man wills, not as you desire, but dividing to every man severally as he wills, as God himself wills, as he desires to give you the gift, you don't get to pick your gift. You can ask, you can request. I believe Paul even told uh, uh, the, the people when he was writing, he said, I'd rather that you not speak in tongues. I'd rather you ask for the gift of prophecy. That's what he said. I'd rather you have the gift of prophecy. You can be more effective. You can go and you can build the kingdom a little bit more. But the scripture says, God divides to every man as he desires. So you can desire, you can ask. God makes the decision of what gift he gives you because how many know the body needs every single gift? I'll say that one more time. The body needs every single gift. And then we get to the body. I'm almost done. I'm hearing. The scripture says, and it's picking up at the 12th verse. For as the body is one and had many members and all the members of that body, of that one body, being many are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We are one. The body of Christ. The members of Christ. Even though there are many members, it's still one body. I've got ten fingers, but it's on one body. Ten toes, but it's on one body. Two feet, but it's all attached to one body and that's what we have to understand when it comes to the church. Yes, there are different gifts and you shouldn't be jealous of mine just like I shouldn't be jealous of yours because it's not for my own gratification. It's to build the kingdom of God. I, I ought to be able to urge you to build and restore and, and gather your gift and increase in your gift and not have to put you down for your gift not being my gift. He says we're all in one body. And in the body, there's different members. There's going to be some that can uh, join the singing member, uh, me, uh, the uh, singing portion of the body. There, there's some that can join the ushering portion. But some of us ain't got the patient. We, you've got everybody that can be in every different portion, but it's all one body. So he says, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made all to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member. There is no body that is just one, no living body that is just one body. But many, if the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? God created each and every one of us and disperse gifts to each and every sanctified or, or fueled with the Spirit of God believer to be able to participate in the body. He says, if the foot don't say to the hand, listen, I'm not a part of the body, does that exclude him from the body? No, because he's still connected. It's still connected. And I come to tell you on tonight that we are the same way. My ears can't do what my feet do. My, my feet don't hear, but my ears do. My nose can't do what my eyes do, but it's all vital to the body. And I want you to know tonight that you're vital to the body. Whatever your gift is, whatever portion of the member that you are in the body of Christ, we are important and God made us for, God made us for that reason. It says, and if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? 
But now had God set the members, every one of them, in the body. If our whole body was going to be an eye, <laughs> all we doing is looking. If our whole body was an ear, all we doing is hearing. But God had a purpose and a plan for the membership uh, 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 of the body. And he says, every one of them is the body as it pleaseth him. And if there were all members, where were the bodies? But now, there are many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Watch this. The eye cannot tell the hand, I don't need you. Nor again the hand to the feet, the head to the feet. The head can't say, I can't, I, I, I don't need you. Which seem to be, uh, I'm sorry, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Even the portions of the body that seem minuscule. Seem like you don't need the, 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 the pinky toe. It doesn't, it doesn't seem important. But if you lose it, you're going to know that you lost it. Your pinky finger don't seem too important. I can still write. But if you lose a portion of the body, a member of the body, you will tell that it's gone because it's all important. And it's really necessary. Some of the smallest things that we have are very necessary. So he says, nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we will store more abundant honor. Many times we think that there's some, there's some bad plays, there's some highs and lows when it comes to the body, especially when we're talking about the church. You've got some people that'll look down on the ushers, you'll look down on the mothers, you'll look down on the custodial staff, you'll look down on the security, you'll look down on these things but he says, all these members are of the body, which you think that are less honorable. These were bestowed more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. God knows just who to use, how to use, and when to use. But we've got to understand this is our portion for the body of Christ. This is our responsibility as the church is to make sure we understand that there are different gifts, but it all comes from the same spirit. There are different bodies. You are not going to do what I do. I am not going to do what you do and how you do it. You are gifted in other areas that I am not gifted in. But watch this. If we all work together, the body can run smoothly. Hands can't do what feet do, but as long as the feet stay in its place, as long as my hands stay in their place, we'll be able to get somewhere. Because we can walk if the feet are in position. We're almost done. It says, for our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part with lack, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another, and whether one member suffers, the entire body suffers. If one member suffer, all the members suffer with. I don't know if you've ever been in a position, as I get up in age, and it's not too far up, but as I get upper in age, if I stump my toe, it seems like the pain don't just stay in my toe. If I slam my finger or my hand in a door, if I accidentally tap it against something unnecessarily, the pain don't just, have you ever saw pain shoot other places? Amen. Have you ever had a headache that, it started here, but it started going all through your body. Because when one member suffers, it should, it, it's going to cause the t entire body to suffer. He's saying not only is this uh, with a spiritual thing, but uh, not only is this with a natural thing, but it is the same way with the spiritual. If I see you suffering, it's going to cause the body to suffer. If I see you hurting, I, I, it's going to cause the body to hurt. And that's why the scripture goes on and tells us we mourn with those that mourn. We rejoice with those that rejoice. Ain't no reason or no uh, the way that we should have any jealousy or animosity when it comes to the members if we're all in one body. I'm moving quickly. And the members suffer with it. And one member be honored. All the members should rejoice with it. 
Now you are the bodies of Christ and members in particular. And God had set some in the church. What did he do? First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets. Then teachers. After that, miracles. Gifts of healings, helps. Governments. Divert, different kinds of tongues. And it wraps us up with these questions. Is everybody an apostle? Is everybody a prophet? Does everybody work miracles? Everybody have the gift of healing? Does everybody speak in tongues? Do all interpret tongues? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way what God has bestowed upon us we have to first understand that it's not ours for the taking. So that's one, one first thing is that God, I thank you for choosing me to hold on to a gift. And just like the scripture that talks about the talents, uh, when one master goes and gives people uh, three of his servants talents, I'm not going to be like the last servant who thought he was going to lose it, so he went and hid his talent. So God, the gift that you've given me, I've got to use it till its full potential. I, I, I want to the, the gift that you get, whether it's the gift of healing, whether it's natural gifts, whether it's natural talents, whatever you gifted me, I want to use it to build the kingdom of God because God has given us drawing power when it comes to His Spirit. And understand, He says, all everybody's not a prophet, everybody's not an apostle. Everybody doesn't work miracles. Everybody's not a teacher. Everybody does not have the gift of healing. Everybody does not speak in tongues. Everybody doesn't interpret tongues. But all of this comes from the spirit of God. So in my conclusion, the purpose of the church, the purpose is not only what we do when we get here. And I'm, not, I'm talking about the actions and whatnot. It is not good enough to just come and clap our hands. It's not good enough to come and say we came, to post about it and post our selfies, to say we're in the house, to, to, to check in our own social media. It's not enough. Especially when we are a child of God, especially when we have the spirit of God and he's given us gifts to work within the kingdom. Our gifts, let me tell you this in my closing. Our gifts are not limited to the building. Our gifts are not limited to the building. That's how you draw people to the building. And not just the building. Overall, that's how you draw people to Christ. By using the gifts that he's given us to be able to tell somebody else that God is real. God is still healing. He's still delivering. He's still making ways. He's still speaking to his people. He's still speaking through his people. But we got to understand that we're all members of a body that we are not the head of. Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. We're just members. We've got to play our role. I thank and praise God just for the word on tonight. Hopefully something was said to encourage or enlighten us on what it means to be the church, because so many people are going to church, but it means much for us to be the church, to be able to tell someone that there is a difference in our life, to tell someone uh, that God is still living and he's still doing just what the Bible said he can and will do. Uh, at this time, I want to see if any have comments, questions, thoughts.